Today I'm delighted to be joined by Becky Murray, who shares her incredible story of how her husband was given just two hours to live. Becky talks about how she found peace to keep going during the most difficult time in her life. Becky is also a missionary and has a children's home and school in Kenya with over 150 children and works to protect them from human and sex trafficking. Becky, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Becky, you're involved in a number of missionaries all over the world, in Africa, in Asia. Incredible the work that you're doing, but take us to the very beginning. Where did it all start? So I was brought up in a Christian house. My mum and dad are phenomenal Christians who taught me the word of God right from a very small age. Um, but I guess my story really starts when I was 18 year old. Um, I went on a short term missions trip to Romania. I'd love to say that's because I was super passionate about missions. <laughs> but actually at that point, I just wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I loved God, but I wanted a nice big house and all the luxuries of life. <laughs> Um, but I went on a short-term missions trip with my church and I was out in Romania actually vol volunteering at an orphanage and I had one day off and for the first time in my life I heard the voice of God in my heart. I'd never heard him before like that uh, but he spoke very clearly to me and told me that one day I would run a children's home. I did what any 18 year old would do. I came home and told everyone, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to run a children's home. <laughs> <laughs> and a year passed by, and then another year passed by, and in fact, a whole decade passed by, and nothing materially seemed to be happening. And I remember thinking, was that God, or was that me? Did I have too much cheese the night before, or, <laughs> you know, what was that about? Um, and well-meaning friends would say, did God say? But I knew in my heart of heart that God had spoken clearly to me. Well, in 2006, I found myself on another short-term mission trip, and I'm very passionate about if you're going to a poor place, you can't tell the hungry man on the street that God loves him, but walk on by and kind of be like, well, God bless you. You know, show him God loves him. Once you've won people's hearts, then you get their ears. And so I'm passionate about if I'm meeting the hungry, to feed them and then tell them about the love of Jesus. So I was out in Sierra Leone and I met this little girl on the streets and um, she quite simply didn't have any shoes. So I took her to the marketplace and bought these beautiful little pink flip flops that cost me about 60 pence. Wow. And then that night we were going to do this huge gospel campaign. And so I'd said to her, go on, get your shoes on and then come back tonight and I'll take you with me to the gospel crusade. So sure enough, it comes to the evening, we're waiting outside the hotel and all the taxis are lined up to take us on through. And this little nine-year-old Felicity, she came up to me and she had her new shoes on and she said, should I wait in your hotel room for you? I said, no, honey, we're, we're just going out. And she turned to me again and said, yes, but shouldn't I remain here for you? Now, if she had turned to my husband and said that, I would have immediately known what she was saying. But she was a nine-year-old little girl looking at another girl, asking if she should wait in a hotel room. So for a third time, I asked her. And sure enough, she thought I'd spent 60 pence on her so that I could have her body in the bedroom. And I remember in that moment just being so angry, not at little Felicity, but that a nine-year-old could have gone through so much abuse in her little life that she would presume that of another woman for 60 pence. I looked her in the eyes that night and I determined in my heart I had to do something. I had no idea what that would look like, but I just knew I had to do something. That night we had the honor of leading her to Jesus. Um, but the tragedy is at that point, there was no children's home, there was no charity. And I had to leave her on the streets that day. And I think that's triggered something in my heart ever since of, it's worth stopping for every single one child or every single one person that we meet because there's so much need that everyone is careful of doing something. Now, you have a project called the Dignity Project um, where you work with in human trafficking, child sex trafficking as well. Tell us a little bit about that project. So 
Um, I've actually opened a children's home up in Kenya. Um, I opened the home back in 2012 and I've got 150 gorgeous babies. And two summers ago, I was out there and I had a mom approach me. Uh, we've got a children's home and a school. And she approached me at the school gates and said, will you pray? My daughter's been missing for three months and I have no idea where she is. Well, I began internally to rationalize how that can happen. I'm kind of thinking in my head, maybe she split from her husband and her husband's removed the children. Maybe the grandparents got her. I'm trying to rationalize it in my head while I'm having this conversation. Within two days of that, I had a second mom come and say, will you pray? My child's been missing for five months. Wow. It caused me to begin to look into it. And sure enough, human trafficking is going on in our little village. Now, where we are is so remote. We're not near a big city. We're really remote. It's just mud huts and then us. There's no supermarkets for hours. And yet human trafficking is going on right there in our tiny little village of Bumala Bay. And so I began to research and find out that because kids in our village, there's no database that they're born onto. There's often no birth certificate. And because of this, it's a trafficker's paradise. And particularly for a child that's an orphan, person can come and take them, take them to the city. And without a parent, there's no advocate even looking for these missing children. And so my heart is to reach the girls before the traffickers do. So we looked into it and basically many of our girls are missing a quarter of education simply because they don't have access to sanitary products. They'll miss a week of school every month. So by the time they've finished primary school, they simply do not have the results to go on to secondary school. And it's at that time they're beginning to look for any job opportunity. There she is, young, beautiful, full of strength. But can you see it? Can you feel it? Her pain, shame, and fear. They were created with a purpose and a destiny. They were created to be protected and instead, they are mistreated, abused, and put on display. Too many turn a blind eye to the abuse and horror these girls face, making them feel small, insignificant, and powerless. But they were made for more than this. year we um, met with about 2,000 girls and then this year we're reaching another two and a half thousand girls with this project. How were you able to get the funding for all of this? How did it all start? So it started I guess way back so um, I did a feeding program back in 2006 and I had a precious mama out in Sierra Leone cooking for me. I had to get someone else cooking because I can, I can burn water. Um, but I had this beautiful mama cooking a box of rice and it was food to feed 50 people. And when I arrived at the venue, which was a derelict bush shelter where amputee victims were living, when I got there, there was about 100 people there. And I remember being horrified thinking, you know, I've got the people here under the pretense of a feeding program. And if I now don't have enough food to feed them, does that reflect, reflect badly on the gospel? And I was kind of panicking. Um, but we just, we shared the gospel that day and then just began to serve out the food. And it wasn't until the end of the day and a lady came out with this uh, washing bowl and she said, there's a family in the house here who have been far too ill to come out. With whatever leftovers you have, can they have it? I said, yeah, sure. It wasn't until we're scraping the leftovers into this huge washing bowl that I realized what we were finishing with after feeding a hundred people was bigger than the little blue box of rice we'd started with. And I remember thinking at that time, that's crazy. The following day, I'm out again doing a second feeding program. And there was just me and one other girl and we're right out in the outbacks of Sierra Leone, completely on our own with a translator, which by the way, I don't recommend. But I was <laughs> young and just super passionate and uh, maybe not the wisest move. But when we got to the venue, we'd get, again got this little blue box to feed 50 people. And when we walked in the venue, there were almost 200 people there. And I remember my hands were sweating. I'm thinking, I'm in trouble here. I'm going to be the lunch today because these people are hungry. 
And um, we began to serve out the food. I remember one of the ladies who was helping to serve out the food was saying, listen, you're giving way too big a portion. You're going to run out of food. You've got nowhere near enough food to begin with. And the size portions that you're giving, you're going to run out after you've maybe not even covered a quarter. But we really believe when you're feeding the hungry, don't give them a little appetizer, but really feed them properly. And so we continued. And I remember what God had done just yesterday. So we continued, but she came back a third time and said, listen, your portion size is too big. Now, if my little blue box of rice had still been full, I would have carried on. But by this time, my little blue box has got maybe this much rice left in it. And for a second, I almost wavered. And so we continued giving the same size portions out. I remember putting the last three plates out on the, on the table in front of me. And I'm literally thinking, this is it. And the same woman who three times had said, you need to give smaller portions, she came back up and she said, well, that's it. Everybody's eaten. And there were three plates spare that day. And I remember thinking, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not the lunch today. And just being amazed that actually, you know what? God cares far more about the poor than I ever can. So fast forward now, I've had been carrying this dream of a children's home for years. And it comes to the point where I've got the land and suddenly the huge bill drops in my lap. I have £1,000 in our bank account, which I had been saving up for months upon months upon months upon months. And all of a sudden, this bill drops on my lap. That's for £150,000. Wow. So as I'm looking at this bill, it may as well have been for a million pounds because I had 1000 which took me forever to get. And here's a bill for £150,000. But in that moment, holding that bill... The only thing I could think about was a little blue box of rice that when we stepped out in faith, God just suddenly stepped in. And so every time now when I'm meeting a challenge of faith, I think back to the little blue box and that carries me through. Speak to our viewers today, uh, Becky, of viewers who are struggling in their own lives, maybe financially or any personal circumstance that they're going through and they're seeking something, they're seeking they maybe haven't got a relationship with Christ just yet. Tell them a little bit about the importance of having faith and having a relationship with Christ. My faith is the only thing that's kept me going. Um, two years ago, my husband was given two hours left to live. He contracted a rare um, malaria, a rare um, strain of malaria, and it affected his brain, his heart, his lungs, his liver, and his kidneys all shut down. And the doctors took me in a side room and said, listen, your 27-year-old husband has about two hours left to live. We'll give him pain relief to see him through, but there's not much more we can do. And in that moment, just everything seemed to just fall to pieces. I'm thinking, how do I raise our precious little boy by myself? How do I carry on uh, our work in Kenya and Sri Lanka by myself? How, 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 how? How do we do life? And then all of a sudden, the peace that surpasses understanding came and it guarded my heart and it guarded my mind. And without Jesus Christ, I don't know how I could have carried on. He is the hope. He is the hope for tomorrow. And I don't know what situation any of the viewers are going through today, but if they will put their faith in Jesus Christ, he is the one who will carry them through. He is the one that puts a peace in their heart and a love in their heart and carries them from through. You've got a project called Hope for Sri Lanka. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right. About two years ago, um, every time I came to pray, the nation of Sri Lanka would, would come into my mind. And I booked a flight out there. Um, I met someone quite by chance, as it were. Um, but I met someone who just so happened to run one of the biggest churches in Colombo, um, which is the capital of Sri Lanka. And so I find myself in his living room within a few months' time, and he began to really open up and share about just the atrocities that's gone on. Sri Lanka had gone through almost a three-decade-long civil war where the North was trying to get independence from the South, and rebels had ri risen up in the North, known as the Tamil Tigers, and war had broke out. But in the midst of that, innocent civilians were just killed in their thousands. 
And so the following year, we managed to get right up into Jaffna, the very top province of Sri Lanka. And basically, there's so many widows, hundreds and hundreds of widows. Some of those are little wrinkly old ladies, and some of them are actually very young women, younger than I am, with small children to try and raise. They lost their husbands in the war. They lost their houses in the war. Some of them lost limbs. Some of them lost children. And they're just a broken, a broken people. And when we began to speak to these precious women, they actually described themselves as the forgotten people. You see, Sri Lanka is still being investigated for war crimes. And so many of the big organizations aren't allowed in. And the people there thought they'd been forgotten about. The, the war ended officially in 2009. But actually, when you speak to people, it's as if it ended yesterday. Mm. Still on the streets, you'll find soldiers with big machine guns. Yeah. Yeah. And these widows are just broken. And we found out that many of them are literally eating leaves to survive. They're doing any kind of work they can to survive to just try and feed their children and themselves. And so we started a feeding program out there um, called Hope Sri Lanka. And so we went in, we fed them, we told them all about the love of Jesus Christ. And many of the widows used to be Hindus or Buddhists. And many of them are now turning to Jesus Christ because they're realizing there is a hope for tomorrow. And that hope is Jesus. Now tell us a little bit about the, um, the project that you have, the King's Children's Home in Kenya. That's right. So we run a children's home called the King's Children's Home. It's a home, a school and a church. And then in time to come, we're building a secondary school and a medical facility out there. And so I'm seeing this whole village start to rise up. Uh, but our kids, when we got their social workers report back in 2012, my husband and I just sobbed. Words like torture, rape, every single abuse you can imagine were coming up on the social workers report. And we just sobbed thinking, how on earth, where do we start with these kids? But just love is the greatest weapon we have. And just loving these kids, we've seen them begin to transform. So the home's now been open for, we're in our fifth year this year. And watching the children transform throughout the years, watching the older children now loving on the new younger kids coming in is certainly for me just incredible. Some of my older boys who haven't had uh, father figures in their own lives, watching them love on the little boys coming in is just, it makes me want to cry because it's just watching them being healed up and then the expression of them being healed is they now loving each other. And um, to see them give their hearts to Christ, some of them got filled with the Holy Spirit, we take them out with us into the village they often lay hands on the sick and see them healed. It's wow. just remarkable what God's doing there. Give us a little insight. Give us an example of a testimony or, or something that you've seen, how a life has been changed. Give us an example of that. Let me backtrack. In September of 2013, I went across my children's home. There's a, a medical clinic. and They allow us to go in and pray for the sick there. And I met this lady who was dying of typhoid and malaria. And we prayed for her and nothing really seemed to happen. I'd love to say she ripped out the cannula and jumped out of bed, but that simply didn't happen. And I remember walking out of the medical center that day thinking I'd never see that lady again. Woman of great faith, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the December of 2013, I returned back to the home and this lady was there with a little boy called David. And the lady turned to me and she said, you, you don't recognize me, do you? I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I meet a lot of people every time I'm out there. I'm, I'm sorry. She said, I'm the lady that you prayed for in September. She said, after you'd gone, I began to recover. And that same day, she was discharged. She went from deathbed to discharge in that one day. And so she began to ask her, who are the white people for a start? Why are they here in our tiny little village? And who's this Jesus that they kept praying about? So the locals uh, told about the King's Children's Home, that that's why we have we take teams out there regularly. So we've always got a team of white people with us and that they're there for the King's Children's Home. But actually they're Christians and that's why they told you about Jesus. So this lady goes back to her village, which is the village next door to ours, and begins to tell everybody what Jesus has done. As a result of that, she's telling everyone about the King's Children's Home. And so they brought to her this little boy called David, who she's now bringing to me. And basically, David's mum had died when he was five. 
he's nine by this point. And his da dad lived and worked away. So for four years, David had lived entirely by himself. So we got on a motorbike and we're going through these little tiny dirt tracks for about two kilometers. And then all of a sudden the bike stops and he said, I can't get any further. You're going to have to walk from here. So we walked through brambles, literally this high, walking through it. And every time we came to a clearing, I think, oh, this must be where David lives. But we just kept on going and kept on going until finally we came to the end of this deserted wood. And there entirely by itself was this little mud hut. I'll never forget the smell as they opened this little wooden door and just the smell of damp and rot hit me. And there was this little tiny mattress on the floor that was absolutely wet through. And that's where David had lived entirely alone for four years. He literally had eaten grass and worms just to make it from day to day. And I remember trying to embrace David that day. I'm, um, I just tried to hold him and he kind of just breeze blocked and looked at me like, who are you and get off me. And he was so unfamiliar with human interaction. It, it, even now thinking about it, it breaks my heart. He just, he wasn't used to any affection of any sort. And we took him back to the children's home that day and he moved in right there and then that day. But I remember he had no emotion. He, it, we gave him a meal nothing he wouldn't say anything he wouldn't even say thank you he, he, he wouldn't speak he wouldn't react in any way well fast forward a few years he's lived with us now and now all of a sudden he barely laughs with the other boys and he's dreaming to be um i think it's a doctor he wants to oh, be wow. and just to see a little boy suddenly come alive rather than just surviving he's suddenly come alive and he's now living and to see that, only the love of Christ can do that. No, no hot meal can do that. What a lovely testimony there. That's yeah. wonderful, Becky. Now, you also had some um, situations in your own personal life with your son as well when you were trying to start the whole missionary. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right. Many people, when we started the children's home, as I say, I got the huge bill for 150000 and so everybody kind of suspects, oh, we must have been going around churches or doing loads of fundraising events or you must have done something. But actually that year was 2011 when I got a bill. And in 2011, I gave birth to my gorgeous little boy. His name's Josiah. And he has me completely wrapped around his little finger as any little boy does with their mummy. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, Josiah was born with a rare genetic disorder called Hirschsprung's and um, he was very, very poorly. And I'll never forget the look on the surgeon's face. The surgeon had actually just done a day shift and was waiting to go home, but he turned to us and he said, I can't go home because I don't know if this little boy will make it through the night and I can't rest knowing that. And to have a surgeon telling you they don't know if your little boy's gonna make it through the night was hard words to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, and he did a, a, an emergency surgery on him there and then that evening, and that's when they discovered the Hirschsprungs, but actually it took five surgeries to get our little boy well. And so for the whole of that year, we spent the entire year in hospital just learning how to love our own little boy. In that year, it was just a horrific year. Um, he wasn't well for a long, long time afterwards. Uh, but thankfully, God brought him through that we had incredible doctors and nurses who I'm so grateful for, who worked very, very hard on him. And God did bring him through. But it was in that same year of our huge weakness, at our greatest need, where God brought in the finances. And there were a couple of big gifts, but actually there were a lot of little old ladies putting 10, 20 pounds in our hands saying, put that towards the work. And there were a few miraculous checks through the post of people saying, God's laid you on my heart and I feel I need to send you this for whatever reason. And sure enough, all the money for the children's home came in in the very year we spent the entire time in hospital simply nursing our own dying little boy. You've certainly been through it, Becky, with the experience you've gone through with your son and also your husband. And just certainly of the viewers out there who are struggling with faith once again, and maybe they're going through a, a health situation. They've, given, they've been given certain news from the doctors and they've been given no hope. What advice would you give to them? Keep trusting. You know, I remember when Matthew was in the hospital dying, 
I, I went to the traffic lights. I was driving on the way to the hospital. I had no money with me. My fuel light had been flashing since the day before, but my head was all over the place because Matthew was dying. And um, I remember getting to the traffic lights and suddenly realizing that it'd been flashing since the day before and I had no money with me. And I remember being at these traffic lights thinking, if I get to the hospital, I don't have enough fuel to get home. I don't have any money to even buy a coffee for today. And it was so little by the side of my husband dying, but it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I just sat at these traffic lights and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I prayed all my powerful prayers in day one and two. And I remember I remember saying to God, can my, pray, can my tears be the prayers at the moment? Because I had no words left. I, I didn't know what else to say. I just needed a miracle. But I arrived at the hospital and before going into the ICU unit, you had to wait in this little reception area and you had to call for permission to go in in case you walked in at a point where they weren't resuscitating or anything like that. And I stood in this reception room and the nurse is calling, can Mrs. Murray come through? And a total stranger came up to me and she said, I have no idea why, but I just feel I need to give you this. And she put $50 in my hands. And the $50, it cost me 40 to fill the tank with fuel. We were out in America at the time. So $40 to fill the tank with fuel and $10 to go get a coffee. Huh. And it was so little. At this point, my husband's still dying. Everything's still going terribly wrong. In this moment of just hell going on, she put $50 in my hands. And I remember just sensing God saying at that moment, I got this. And if in your hour of greatest need, you will just put yourself in his hands he will take care of you he loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life and if he's got the little things like being able to fill your car with fuel then he's got the big things like being able to heal someone who is on his deathbed we always have two options in our hour of greatest need we can either run from god or we can lean into god and if we'll just lean into him in those moments he will carry you through the darkest of nights the answers don't always go the way we want them to, but if we'll just lean into him, he will carry us through. Becky Murray, thank you, thank you thank so you. much indeed for your inspirational testimony, and thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Thank you. God bless.